and I'm sure you're smelling fantastic. Oh, guess what? You. Guess what I'm wearing? Uh, it's Senza Devi Bisco. Uh, no, another one of yours that I really like. Oh, it's got to be Formula X. Yes, that is the fragrance. Um, I just posted this in my story. This is the fragrance that um, that pulled me into your perfume house. I met you 2016 in That's San Francisco. <laughs> And, um, you know, that was kind of like my first time being able to meet indie perfumers face to face, uh, to have conversations. And I was so, I was so blown away that, you know, you guys are like movie stars to me and mm -hmm. you were so welcoming. You took me in, you, you actually spoke to me, you saw my excitement and, um, it just means a lot to have you on today. Oh, thank you. Well, I think you're doing a great job. You know, I think that your passion is is loud and you can feel it when talking to you, especially like in the room. I mean, I'm talking to you now, but like to really be in the same space with you, your passion is so palpable. And um, I really love what you're doing to, I don't know, get the word out about your passion for fragrance and for what the art form is and, and trying to put the faces with the brands. And I, I think it's a great thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dawn. I really, really appreciate that feedback. Um, so you mentioned perfume. So uh, if you're watching this broadcast and you don't know who this young lady is, um, she's a big deal in the world of perfumery. Um, I was uh, yesterday, one of my followers said, uh, one of the first ladies of indie perfumes is the, uh, the reference that was made. And, um, this came from Studio Scent SF, uh, a perfumer that I haven't smelled her work, but I highly respect because of the type of conversation she brings to, uh, my platform and the type of feedback she's offered. So she, uh, called you one of the first ladies of indie perfumes That's so cool. yeah well and i am one of the sort of the pioneers in america um, uh -huh. one of the you know handful of people who in the early 90s was was making perfume and and promoting artisanship and and just sort of like putting out that idea of fragrance is art form because uh -huh. Aged it as one of my art forms. Um, I mean, I'm a classically trained painter, so I come from a visual art background. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not my first art form, but um, back in the day when I was first getting going, um, you know, people would ask what I'm doing and they would be like, <laughs> what is that? Or, you know, what do you do for your day job? And I was like, no, this is my day job. This is what I'm doing. And by the way, what you're using for fragrance is an art form. And there are people who make it. It doesn't fall out of the sky and into a store where you buy it already packaged. There are people who are dreaming this and thinking about this. And it's not just about the designer or the label and the fashion. I mean, that's part of it, but it's also like, the people behind it are, are thinking about composing a poem or a song for you and packaging it and then it becomes a part of your world. And that's a dream, you know, that's a dream for us to be able to do. So now 20 some years later, I'll say almost 30 years later, now people know what it is. I say, oh, I'm an artisan perfumer and people are like, oh, that's awesome, I've heard of that. <laughs> so 30, you said almost 30 years. So you were doing this before I was born. <laughs> Um, and, and being one of the, as my follower said yesterday, one of the first ladies of indie perfumes, um, I just think back to my first time meeting you, how humble you were, um, you know, and you're a big deal. And I met you again last September at the Scent Fair in LA. Yeah. And, and, and again, you were just like, hi Glenn, like, you know, just like so down to earth. So, um, I guess people want to know, how did you end up in the world of perfumery having an artist uh paint you say you were a painter yes mm -hmm. how did you stumble into perfumes uh by accident completely i mean i was on this completely different trajectory 
Um, my, my, I was still in art school and my, my goal was to actually be um, a university professor. That was what I wanted to do. And um, I got a job. I met somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody else who had a small perfumery in Boston. And um, I convinced them to hire me. They were looking for someone to do bespoke work. And I convinced them to hire me without any experience. I'd never done retail before. I'd never done perfume before, but I knew I loved perfume. I thought I had a, a good developed aesthetic sense and I needed another job and I convinced them to hire me. And it was kind of like, okay, come and do it. If you can do it, we'll keep you. And if you can't, we'll find somebody else. And uh, I thought that was fair enough. So mm -hmm. kind of like sink or swim. And I swam. And in the process, um, I learned that I have synesthesia. Um, and, you know, a bunch of people probably already know what that is. But if you don't, that means that I get uh, multiple sensation or information from the same stimuli from in multiple senses. So um, I smell in color and texture and shape and line. Um, so every time I smell something new, it has an immediate impression. And sometimes I feel it on my fingers as well as see it. And sometimes I just see it. But um, I didn't know what that was back then. But I know that when I would start to learn all the materials, I, I could learn very quickly because they all had a very unique sensory impression. And so I could be like, that's that one, that's that one, that's that one. And I think that uh, there's a lot to having a good memory for fragrance, mm -hmm. um, to being a perfumer. I've definitely met people with a wonderfully acute sense of smell who can smell lots and lots of things. And they say, oh, I think I should be a perfumer. And I said, well, how's your memory? Not so good. I don't think this is for you. Right. <laughs> um, because you really do have to remember all of the materials and details about each material and each distillation method and what it yields and different, um, you know, the Lang Lang from the Comoros Islands versus Indonesia. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, and whether it's steam distilled or a CO2 extraction or an absolute, and they all have slightly different smells and you have to be able to know them. And so if your ability to take in a sensory impression, and not remember, <laughs> you know, if that's not very good, then maybe perfume design is not for you. But um, okay. anyway, I digress. That's that's sort of how I got into it. And I, I just fell in love. I fell in love with the art form. I fell in love with the fact that it is an endlessly interesting uh, art form to engage in. And I'm never going to ever exhaust all of the materials and all of the ideas that could come from them. It's never going to happen. I'm going to die way before that happens. Okay, okay. All right. So... How has the landscape of what you do changed over the course of 30 years? Oh my gosh. It's kind of literally when I say I'm like a perfume pioneer, like the landscape when I first started was like, there was only Estee Lauder and there was only, um, you know, at least in America, there was only corporate perfume. Right. And there was starting to be L'Artisan and Patricia de Nicolai and Anique Coutal in France. Right. There are some very early niche and artisan perfumer Jean Laporte in in France starting to do their own thing and break away from the perfume houses. But it was so small and such a little, you know, whisper in the wind. And there was literally nothing. So it's a little bit like, you know, those of us at that time going out and like with a machete and like <laughs> clear cutting and trying to like build something, not like clear cutting, but you know what I mean? Like really trying to like blaze a trail, um, say what we wanted to say with fragrance, say that, you know, it's so unique. You can have bespoke made, we can make small batches. We can do something that really feels like it's expressing our lives. We can tell stories and we can do this. We can do this ourselves. It doesn't have to, we don't have to go to a big perfume house or, or try to like create something to get Estee Lauder to produce it for the masses. It can be this thing that's personal. It can be this small made um, materials. You know, we can get these wonderful, brilliant materials and use things that nobody wants to use because it's too crazy and make something artistic and amazing out of it. And so 
with those ideas in mind, you know, we started and then we had students and they started and then we had more students and they had students and so on and so on. it's like that commercial from the 70s like mm -hmm. you know my hair and your hair or <laughs> whatever um but it's sort of the hundred monkey thing of of suddenly enough people knew about it to then have it explode and now you know people talk about scent culture and people talk about you know fragrance as art form as if that's something we've always known Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's an amazing thing to watch and to see develop over these decades and know that, like, in my very small way, I had a part in it. Right. You know, and, cool. And that was, you know, you stole, you stole a couple of my words. The fact <laughs> that the fact that you had a part in that, you know, the story of artisanal perfumes. What would you like your legacy to be? when people talk about your perfumes, you know, down the road? You know, I mean, I already have some kind of a weird, it's either good or bad, or I don't know, reputation, because I'm so prolific, right? So I, I can just say to everybody, you know, my brand is not really in my mind. I don't think about my brand. I don't think about it that way. I'm an artist in a studio making art. So mm -hmm. I treat making perfumes like making paintings. And nobody ever said to a painter, oh, my God, you made seven paintings this year, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, or released 30 paintings this year. Dear God, you're crazy. You know, but in perfume, that's really crazy. But I do things like that because I do it like a, an artist in a studio. And that's sort of like my way. So I already have a kind of like crazy reputation for like releasing like way too much stuff and being nuts that way. So there's that, and I don't think I'll ever escape that. But um, I, I would like I would like my legacy to be that I really stood for art form and really tried to push the envelope and push the art form forward. That is, if there's one thing that is my goal, and what mm -hmm. I do, like push what is possible forward. Yeah. That would be All right. Yeah. I'm going to take a few questions from the audience, if that's okay with you. Hi. So, uh, guys, if you have questions for Dawn, uh, definitely drop your questions. I'm going to try to get to as many as we possibly can. Um, and uh, we always get really, really good questions. So I'm going to scroll back, Dawn, and just make sure I didn't miss any. And uh, sometimes I'm scared to touch the screen because I – I uh I mess it up sometimes. Oh, I so, know. I'm always like, oh God, don't let yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, so I haven't seen any questions yet. So I will go ahead with one of my questions and then we will I will scroll and see. So um like fashion, I know there are trends in perfumery. Um are you a follower? Are you a trendsetter? Where are you within the spectrum of uh, trends and perfumeries. So, so I got like a three pronged answer. <laughs> I like it. For that. Um, so I like to think I'm a trendsetter and sometimes I'm way, way ahead. Like I started using Oud in perfume in 1998 and that was like way early. And so, you know, by the time everybody like caught on to Oud, I was like, yeah, I already did that like nine years ago. You know, so um, I like thinking that I am I'm trend setting, but I also, I'm, I'm not a follower in the sense that I don't really care what the trends are and I'm not always trying to speak to trends, but I will say, so here's the third answer. I, I try to have my finger on the pulse mm -hmm. of, of what's happening and I notice, I notice. I'm watching, I'm looking, I'm listening to my customers I'm hearing what they're telling me that they're looking for, what they're loving, what they need. And I do respond to my customers. So I, I love, one of the things I really love that has developed over the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years is this kind of like per, almost performing arts aspect to being an artisan perfumer where I get to create something and release it. And then the audience speaks back to me about it. Mm -hmm. and says they liked it they didn't like it or it fits what they need or it doesn't fit what they need but here's what they do need or something else that they would need and it's this conversation that's like this back and forth 
mm-hmm. so that I can respond and I do respond when people like are telling me what they're looking for and that really jives with like something I've got kind of percolating. I'm like, great, I'm gonna run with that. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that this year. So it's timely. It's not gonna, I'm not waiting for five years to right. get that out to you, whatever. And I don't have to. That's the beauty of being an artisan is I mm-hmm. can like get an idea and run fast with it if I want to and do whatever I want. <laughs> Oh. I love that. <laughs> That's fair enough. I am going to scroll back. Um, I, I did see a couple of questions come in, so I'm going to scroll back. And let's see here. Let's see here. Um, let's see here. Uh, what a refreshing per- – this is a question from Strong Lives Here. What a refreshing perspective. I joined a little bit. Uh, which perfumery your first career? Um, so it was called Essence Natural Perfumes. It was in Boston on Newbury Street. And um, also Sarah Horowitz Tran, who you had on a few weeks ago, she and I were both working there at the same time. Unreal. Yeah, so she and I met there, actually. That's where I met her. Even though, like, our, we had mutual friends, but hadn't actually met through our mutual friends, but we realized we had mutual friends. And then um, we actually, when that place closed, we started our very first company together. So she and I were business partners for two years in Boston before she left for LA and I came here to Colorado. Um, So yeah, Essence Natural Perfumes was the name of the place way, way back in 1990. (laughs) All right, before we were born. um, Full full confession, for the longest time, I thought you and, you know, Sarah Hurwitz were uh, the same, you know, because the names... She and I both get dear, like I get dear Sarah and she gets dear Dawn. And I'm like, you know, it's a compliment. I think it's awesome. And I mean, what are the odds that I would marry somebody with an almost identical last name to Sarah's? And and we used to joke that when I was engaged that we should change our name to Hurwitz and Horowitz, perfumes <laughs> and law, you know? <laughs> right, right. Somebody yeah, because uh, when we were in LA, um, I was talking to you and she showed up and I, you know, I heard the conversation and I met her and that's when I realized they're two separate entities. <laughs> I, you know, I, I had heard about the Boston story, but I thought that you guys were still one entity from a business standpoint. So um, I'm glad that I was able to have her on and now have you on. So here's the question from uh, Mr. P- uh, Mr. Pina, 27. How do you go from an idea to production? So, um, so if you follow me, um, on my, I do a live stream every, every week on Mondays, mostly Mondays, depending on what's happening with my family. I have a, a son, a small child. So if he's doing something crazy, it might be different. Anyway, um, so about creative process that sort of takes you from, I get an idea, I write it down. Sometimes it's an idea that's like a hurricane that needs to come in and get made like now. And then sometimes it's an idea that I can sit with and be thinking about. And and I design in my head a lot, mostly Mm. in my head before I sit down to do anything in a bottle. Um, It's finished in my head for the most part. Um, I leave a little room for like, maybe I'll discover some path I couldn't have conceived of. So I leave some room for changes to happen once I do start mixing um, some things together. But get an idea, write it down, write it down, write it down. And then think about it, designing, designing, maybe writing myself more notes. And then when I'm ready to actually start formulating, I take all of the notes and I take all of the things I've been thinking about, I put them on the table, I make little strips um, to test them and I smell for all the harmonies. And I edit things out that are not doing the harmonies I suspected they would when I was designing in my head. No, that's not doing it. Nope, off you go. Bye, 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 bye. And you can edit down. And then once I have a clear idea of all my materials that I'm going to want, then I start formulating and I can go right for it. And I sort of use a sculpture term to give an idea of how I'm doing that. And when I'm designing in the bottle, I always get three things in there first. Um, the top note, top notes, the base most notes, so you get the most dynamic range, top to bottom, 
And the mm -hmm. most difficult notes, got to go in first. You got to get all the troublemakers in there first mm -hmm. so that you can then figure out how you tone them down and get them to do what you want them to do. And so write it down, do the editing, sit down, make the armature, the basic form. And then I just work it and, you know, I also go back and forth, do some work in right brain, it's creative flow, let it go, um, let it macerate, come back and evaluate left brain, right? Write down all the things I need to do, come back, right brain, see the things I need to do, do them, let it flow, do it again, do it again, do it again, right brain, left brain, until you're finished. And then, and then production is just a matter of, you know, letting things macerate, you know, filtering things out and put it in a bottle. And there you go. <laughs> wow, just that easy. Anybody can do it, right? <laughs> uh, anybody can do it. It's definitely <laughs> like do it yourself from scratch. I mean, when I first started teaching, um, my very, very first class, I gave a, the first thing I did was I put out a, a sheet and I said, why are you here? What do you want to learn? And what brought you to my class? And I would say 90% of the people all said the same basic thing. Like I'm tired of making Drano at home mm. <laughs> and I want to make something that I like. I have an idea, but I can't actually make it because I don't know what I'm doing. And I want someone to show me how I can think about it and use these materials and have ideas about proportions so that I don't make a mess with my materials at home. Um, so yeah, it's definitely not like, oh yeah, go get yourself some essential oils and start making perfume right. quite like that. I wish. All right. <laughs> um, you ready for another question? Totally. All right, question here from Eternal Send Journey. Which is your favorite indie slash niche house? Oh man, that is a really hard question. Um, Cause I have so many, I mean, how am I gonna, it's like all my brothers and sisters, how do you choose one that you love most? I say name three, name okay. three. Um, so you might not think that Molinar, the house of Molinar is niche, but I think that because they're still pretty small-ish, but they're a historical house um, based in Grasse, um, mm -hmm. they're one of my favorites. Um, yeah, so Molinard is just one of my favorites. I still consider them niche, even though they're kind of not, but, um, niche, niche, niche. Um, I really love Oh Hi Wild. I think that, so Jana is, um, somebody that I work with. So I'll just say that I'm biased because I work with her, but I love her approach, um, of wanting to grow the materials herself and tincture them. And then she has these wonderful tinctures that she builds out perfumes. So it's like the tinctures are the canvas and then she, you know, paints on top of that canvas. And I think that what she's doing is really amazing. So mm -hmm. that's gotta be one. And then, oh man. <laughs> How about, what about one indie? One indie. Um, God, I mean, they're all like coming through my head so fast. I'm like, how to pick? I want to just like pick one out of the air. Like they're going by so fast. Um, one indie. I feel like I should just like look up and see what I see. Because behind me is some of my like museum and I collect indie samples. I collect. So in case anybody is like, oh, I'm a crazy perfume collector perfume. <laughs> you got nothing on me, man. Um, indie, indie, indie. Um, well, I mean, I can say like, I really enjoyed Hans's, Hans Henley. He just sent me some wonderful things and, uh -huh. um, you know, I, I loved a, a number of the, his perfumes that he sent. So I'll just give him a shout out. Cause I mean, and anybody I forgot, I'm sorry, you're on my mind yeah. too, you know what I mean? And, and yeah, so I'll just go there. <laughs> Awesome. I think Henley is in here. Um, he was on, I saw his name pop up earlier. So hopefully he's actually here and watching. So shout out to Henley Perfumes. I actually met him, uh, when I went to New York, uh, last year and, um, very, very humble, very humble dude. And I've had him on my channel as well. So shout out to Henley. And also, um, to say, and also Bruno, I love Bruno. I know he was just recently on your channel, so I can give a shout out to Bruno too. I mean, and then there's Cognoscenti and then, you know, see, I could go off once I get rolling. <laughs> so, I mean, I can't, it's yeah. 
I understand. I understand. So here's an easier question. This comes from Farbud13. And his question is, what is, his question is, uh, what is your latest creation, which is very personal for you? Um, well, you know, so the Au Crepuscule de Levon that just came out, mm -hmm. new, and it's very personal for me because um, some of the research I did, I did on Cape Cod at my um, husband's parents' place on Cape Cod and, and my mother-in-law's growing lavender there. So mm. I got to sort of experience like the grow, I've grown lavender here too, which is very different because of the high altitude. So it's a lot more like France here and there she's at sea level. It's a really different feeling. And then mm. the fact that I never, until now, until Au Crepuscule de Levant, I had never worn perfume to bed. Oh. Because I'm thinking about perfume and doing perfume all day, all day, all day. And my nighttime is my not scented time. And, and yet I, I started wearing it to bed and it's been amazing. It's been really wow. good. Yeah, it's really relaxing. It really helps me sleep. But it doesn't smell like lavender aromatherapy. Right. I think it's super important. And also my husband. So my husband got um, chicken pox on his 30, either 32nd or 33rd birthday. And mm -hmm. I nursed him through chicken pox. And of course, I used a lot of lavender and poultices and things so that he has no scars. Um, mm. from the pox, but now he has a serious aversion to lavender. Mm. Yeah, because of, it like brings back that memory. And so um, for me to be able to wear the, the lavender to bed, it cannot smell like regular lavender or else there'd be trouble. Very big, very big testament. Um, and thank you for your, to your husband for sharing all your wonderful talents with us <laughs> as a fragrance community. Uh, um, that's sweet. So here's a question from Joe sent me. Uh, his question is, I'm curious about your fragrance DNA. Do you have a DNA or do you prefer not to have a signature within your perfume brand? So I don't have, you know, like a Garlinade or a Towerade, you know, I don't, I don't do that. Um, because it's really important for me to feel like I can master any style or, mm -hmm. or at least speak to, I don't have a master, but that's like, hmm. um, but I could speak to any style and because I want to be able to do anything I want to do, I feel like that would be for me limiting because I'd, I'd have to be sure that my, my dawn odd could, could mix with everything, right? And because I wanna be able to be free and do whatever I wanna do, and because I do so many wildly different kinds of scents, um, I don't, I don't think so. Although I will say that some people are like, I can always tell when it's yours. I don't know. So maybe there's something in there I do subconsciously, but I definitely don't consciously have a, a signature DNA to all of my fragrances. I don't. Okay. All right. Uh, here's a question from myself. Um, there are a lot of indie, a lot of niche brands on market. What is DSH perfumes bringing that's different from other things that are on the market? So one, well, one thing that I can say is that I'm, I'm bringing like my own storytelling. I am, I'm bringing my vision, my person. I think that every indie, every artisan is certainly um, out there to speak their, their truth and to sing their song. And hopefully they find an audience who wants to listen and smell. Um, so I'm bringing my own vision. Right. And then, um, I mean, as a brand, I feel like I can, I can bring a lot of diversity. I have a lot to choose from. I have a lot, you know, something for everyone, I feel. Um, and because I'm always making stuff, just wait. <laughs> there, there will be something someday. Um, and then I also, because I listen to my customers, and a lot of my customers are connoisseurs and collectors, um, one of the things that I do, and I have a little example, is I do minis which I do lots and lots of sizes. And I think that that's like a very big deal um, because I know what it's like. I'm a collector too. So I wanna get a lot of little things. I want a little bit of everything. And you, 
who has the money and the time and whatever to have a big of everything, right? Who does? And so I think that having little amounts you can buy and have the pleasure of using them up. You, you know you love something when you use this up. If you didn't use this up, you don't love it that much. You like it, but you don't love it, right? But if you Fair. used it up and you need more because you went there and there's nothing left and you're like, oh, I wanted more. Now you know you can get a bigger bottle and feel good about it. It's a good feeling to be like, I used something up because how many bottles of stuff do you have? I bet you have a lot, we all do, that are partially used and you know you're never really gonna use it up and that doesn't feel good. So right. I do think that like as a commercial thing that I do for my customers that I do that not a lot of people do is that. Um, is a lot of different sizes and then, you know, I mean, I'm just always whistling a new tune, so stay tuned <laughs> I'll have something new for you. <laughs> um, that's a very good point. I'm glad I asked that question because I don't think uh, a lot of people know this. So that's a very, very good um, benefit, I would say. I'm going to scroll back here, look at some more questions. Um, let's see here. Question from Matt Asian. Um, he, his question is, as you just let's see here, as you describe creating this symphony and knowing that you have synesthesia, are there times you create fragrances with discordant notes? And what did you see or feel with the end product? Um, I generally, unless I'm specifically wanting to talk about discord, I feel like there's plenty of discord that we all feel on a daily basis without having to go to perfume for discord. That's just me. I know there are a lot of people who like for their art, they want to talk about discord. I like to talk about harmony. I like to talk about melody. I like to talk about beauty. So for the most part, I'm not talking about discord in my, in my work, unless the brief or the, the, maybe sometimes it's an art project. And if the art project is saying, I want you to create something about discord, then I will. And a lot of times I'm still trying to create a balance, even if there's discord or like a, mm, some kind of like thing that's rubbing against, right? Um, mm -hmm. I still need to find something else that frames it, that allows for that to exist without me feeling like it's gonna shatter the glass. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I can tell you that when I am asked to do discord, I am uncomfortable. Oh. I am uncomfortable. And, and I have to work through my discomfort to find, again, that framing that will at least make me feel like, oh, okay, ha, I can breathe with this. Because if it's too discordant, I can't breathe with it, and then I'm not happy, and I can't do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's, so, that's, <laughs> that's a fair answer. Yeah. Good question by Matt Asian. Yeah. Um, so... It is said that perfumery is an art and it's a science and perfumers live somewhere along a spectrum. Where is Dawn in that spectrum? Um, so I, that's an easy question in a way. I am not a scientist. I am not a chemist. Um, I have only the rudimentary um, chemistry skills. I'm an artist and I think about my materials like paint, right? Mm. Um, and I paint with them. I am not, you know, there's some perfumers that are really interested in the chemistry and that's really their thing. And they even are trying to like create their own molecules, which I can't imagine. I, I'm fascinated by it. And I think the people who engineer molecules who do that are incredible architects mm -hmm. of amazing things. And I have such high regard for them, but I have no interest in doing that. That's not my thing. I don't need to make the paint. I just want to paint with the paint. All right. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so I am definitely on the, on the art side. And even my students, when, it, when I get a new student who's coming to me to look, uh, to maybe study with me, I explain right up front that, like, if they're looking for chemistry skills, I'm not the right person to come to. There are lots and lots of people who know how to do that, who know perfumery, chemistry, and could teach you the rudiments of that. But I don't know if they totally have, like, an ability to teach you aesthetics, Ah, this is what I know how to do. I can teach aesthetics. I, I feel like I can help hone people's understanding of their own aesthetic and help them find their voice. This is what I'm good at. Um, yeah, so I, that puts me definitely on the like art side of this spectrum, right. for sure. 
That's that's fair. So I want to shift gears a little and talk about my experience at the Scent Fair um, LA last September. Your table was located between the inner part of the setup and the outer. Yeah. And every time I went by, I smelled this perfume here. <laughs> And because you were displaying it to people, I had a chance to smell it at various stages of its development. Right. And I was captivated. Um, it's no secret in the fragrance community that I appreciate florals as a man. I love bold florals and this fragrance. Um, I ended up buying it and I've had it in my house since then in the box. <laughs> And because it was so, it was so special to me. I wanted to wait on a special occasion. I was going to wear it, like I think either Christmas or New Year's. But New Year's, I felt I wanted something a little bit more, you know, different. Sure. And I was just like, you know, when I, my birthday came, I ended up wearing like my favorite in, uh, niche perfume. And then once we decided to do this, I was like, perfect opportunity. And I open it up. I wore this to work the day, bef uh, day before yesterday or, or yesterday, I remember. I was a little light on the trigger because, you know, first time wearing it out, I'm going to work. I don't know what this thing is going to do. Right. And I wish I had put on more. I could smell it on me. But I was like, I could have gone heavier. This thing, in addition to being a, such a bold, beautiful floral, there's a yumminess, a creaminess in here, and I want to talk about this perfume. What I know, I know it's a remix, but I don't know how close is this to the original. If we should just talk about this, or we should talk about the original and then this. Um, well, the original wasn't all that different. Although this, um, I I pushed away from it, the original was slightly more indolic, so a little bit more raspy and animalic, and mm. there was also a little bit less fruit. So, um, Michelin at Soft Sorbonne, um, mm -hmm. who was the original sort of like instigator of this collection, right? Mm -hmm. She's a great idea person. She puts out, you know, she does so much um, to put out ideas. And she mm -hmm. gave me this idea for this collection for the Heirloom Elixir, because I was lamenting one day, like, oh, I have all these perfumes I'll never get to. I have all these notebooks full of ideas I'll never get to. She's like, you should just, you know, put them out as limited editions. They're here, then they're gone. Do them again, you know, whatever. And she was like, so when you do that, what I would request is that you do my favorite fragrance that's discontinued and remake it and do it again. So basically, Essenza Deli Visco, um, I made with her in mind with the added fruit, especially because she really loved the plum. And um, I added more plum for her and, and pushed the indole so there would be like this thing for her. Anyway, that's kind of how this version came about. Um, what are people saying about this fragrance? I'm just curious. Um, well, so that was limited edition and it sort of like mm. has already closed. Mm. <laughs> so people can't get that fragrance now, but um, the people who bought it were just like, I bought the, you know, some of the people were actually people who bought it the first time and were, mm -hmm. you know, because the deal with this collection is once the edition closes, if you bought it, you can get more, right? Okay. So even after okay. it's closed, so now you've bought a bottle, you can get okay. it as long as I can make it, you can get it. Okay. So um, people who, who bought it are just like gaga for it. They just, they're like, I love this. Oh, and this sort of brings me to another question that you gave me, which is, um, you know, what are some of my best selling fragrances and tuberose, my regular just tuberose is my best selling floral overall. And um, so it has a lot in common with the Essenza Deli Bisco because it's tuberose centric um, mm -hmm. the, in the heart. I mean, it's, it's a bouquet, right? But it's tuberose centric. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely one of those things that like for the people who love it, they love it. You know, just want to bathe in it. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to take a few questions from the audience. Let's see here. I'm going to scroll. I'm going to scroll. Um, let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see here. Ooh, I can't find it. Can't find it. <laughs> I swear. All right. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling back the other way. All 
All right. So here's a question from Look at Jess. How has your work as a perfumer affected your everyday smells? Great question. Um, well, so I'm sure you've heard people say that your sense of smell is like a muscle and it, the more you use it, the better you get at it. So, um, and so two things actually. So yes, I smell everything, but I've gotten really, really good at, because I know what I'm smelling a lot of the time, I can decide to turn it off. Like that smell, I don't want to smell, turn it off. So I can wow. it's like, because even here in my studio, sometimes people walk in and if we've been doing a lot of work, they'll be like, how can anybody choose anything in here? It's so fragrant. I'm like, give it a moment. Your brain will turn it off. And I certainly can just decide I'm not smelling that. I'm smelling this, not that. This, not that. Mm. And I think the only thing I can't turn off is gasoline smells. Like petrol mm. lamp smells. I can't, I can't turn that off. That's too annoying. And I have to, or cigarettes. And I have to get away from it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I feel like that's like an everyday thing where, you know, so I say smell everything. <laughs> All right. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to scroll back some more, see if there are other questions. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see here. Ah, oh, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to scroll on here. I know. I, I'm the worst oh. trying to deal with machines of any kind. All right, so here's a question from George Love Fragrance. Um, he says, let's talk Shipra. Any suggestions or recommendations from your house? Shipra fragrances. Okay, so um, Lila de Minuit is based very much on Cody's, Francois Cody's Shipra that sort of starts mm -hmm. the whole thing rolling, right? Um, with a lilac forward bent. And there is lilac in the original, but this is like bringing the lilac and putting it in the spotlight with the rest of it being spotlighted around Francois Cody's Sheeper design. And then, um, and that's, so that's pretty bold and a little bit floral. If you like a more traditional uh, Sheeper, I would say, hmm, what would I say? Um, the smoking is sort of on the green side. It's a little bit, tobacco-y, but very traditional Shipra. Um, and then there's Firefly, which is a sort of like toned way, 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 way down and made very uh, sheer. So it's a very sheer kind of like traditional Shipra. Um, gosh, there's so many. And there's uh, Noel Enchanté, which I actually just sent you a sample of. That's kind of a fun twist on Shipra because it's a tuberose gardenia Shipra. So again, I kind of like doing this like floral Shipra because I think that it allows you to do things with florals and then you have this like resting place of the oak moss to help you go there. Or like um, fire opal is a very bright orange and spice in the top note, but it technically dries down to Shipra. Um, Il Maranayo de Capri, that's a green floral Shipra again. It does honeysuckle and it's designed for guys, but it ultimately dries down to a, a lovely kind of soft oak moss. So those are all ones I could heartily recommend. So, so you've got some options clearly. <laughs> um, while we're talking about those fragrances, we have about, we have about 10 more minutes. So I want to first talk about, um, how, what is your recommendation for the best way to approach a perfume house? Okay. And, and then we'll go back into questions till we wrap up. Okay. Um, well, so he, here's two things, uh, three things, maybe I'm, I'm always on three prong, <laughs> I think. Um, one, we have lots and lots and lots of discovery sets. So I realize that we have 5 million things on our website. I mean, literally like a few hundred things. To, to look at and smell and they all hopefully sound good. Um, so if you're not sure where to start, we have a lot of discovery sets and we have some that are, you know, basically like if you love a sheep rub, or if you're a guy and you like dark wood or light wood or you, you know, like certain flowers or whatever, we have sets set aside for you. And then um, another thing that we offer is something called um, find your essence. And that's a discovery set where you give us a bunch of information about you. 
and what you like and we will pick for you. We will curate from our collection for you. So it's a custom made discovery set where we will curate for you out of everything based on the information you give us. So, mm -hmm. um, yep, that's the find your essence set. And then, I mean, if you're really just not sure, send us an email or, or you know, Instagram message or whatever. I'm happy to like try and help you find something to start with. And we will always recommend that you start small. We're never going to be like, get the big size. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if anything, I talk people out of buying too big on their first purchase. I'm always like, no, okay. we're going to be here. You ship all over the place. Get a small one. Find out you love it and you need more. I'd rather. I feel better about it. I want you to be so happy and so psyched. I do not want you to have that like wah wah feeling about buying too much. Right. Um, do you ship worldwide? We do ship mostly worldwide. Interestingly enough, Italy is a place where there is a restriction. Even if it's not hazmat, you cannot ship any perfume product except for soap. Hmm. What do you know? So Italy's out. Um, there's a few, yeah, there's a few places where like Russia right now out, <laughs> there's a few, we're okay. always checking the restrictions. And the only thing I say mm -hmm. is we ship worldwide. However, um, because eau de parfum is alcohol, alcohol based, it's dangerous goods. It's hazmat. We could ship that FedEx to you, except it's like the shipping is going to be like $300. That's not even the perfume. Mm -hmm. That's the shipping. Most people Wow. much on the shipping for their thing to ship it legally. So we format things in isopropyl mirror state, which is still fine mist sprayable, but it's not alcohol. It has mm -hmm. a super high flash point, which makes it not dangerous goods. So we can ship it in the post and that makes okay. it legal for us to do that and not so expensive. And the only real difference is that isopropyl mirror state. So those are the things called wall, whatever, wall de parfum. I'll answer the question because mm -hmm. I know this is a question we get all the time. So maybe some of your viewers would be interested. The difference between say Eau de Parfum and Wild de Parfum is no difference in terms of the base fragrance design or the concentration. It's just one is alcohol and one is isopropyl mirror state. That's it. But isopropyl mirror state, because it's a sprayable oil, tends to bring out more base notes and push against top notes. So if you love mm. top notes, you're not going to be 100% happy with it. I'll just admit it. You're not going to be 100% happy with that. Um, but if you love base notes, you don't really care about the top notes, then you're going to actually be like, this is better than ever. So <laughs> um, there you are. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we have time for maybe one or two more questions because Instagram sets a limit on how long we can chat. So I'm going to scroll back. My apologies if we didn't get to everyone's questions. We had really, really good yeah, questions. Um, let's see here. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Um, let's see. Uh, this is a question from Sense and I. He says he's wearing Parfums Deluxe by DSH. Can you please talk about the notes in it? Okay. So this is one I really love, Parfum Deluxe. And this is actually one that I designed in the 90s. So I'm happy to say it's still in production. People are still loving it, you know, 20 years later. Um, it has a very classic eau de cologne top note structure, which is very similar to say the House of Guerlain, like all of their classics, Shalimar and Mitsuko. They all kind of, Voldemort, they all kind of start out with this eau de cologne, fresh, bergamot, lemon, rosewood, mandarin kind of thing, structure in the top note. And then they move into what's different about them. And so Parfum Deluxe, because it's meant to be this kind of art deco fragrance and a sort of retro, um, retro nouveau 1930s kind of thing. Um, it has this eau de cologne top note structure, but then it moves into um, jasmine and rose, very traditional to the South of France. Um, orange blossom, beeswax, and then it goes into a tobacco, which is the main focus. Tobacco, but paired with something a little bit modern, so praline, right? So it has this really wonderful caramelized sweetness on the back end of the tobacco, which really brings out mm. that kind of like chewy, sweet, ambery, warm um, nuances with that. 
I list it kind of as a tobacco sheepra. So there's some oak moss and I'm using real oak moss. I'm not using, you know, a synthetic or the IFRA um, messed with oak moss material. Um, so oak moss. What's that? I said folk moss. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, because there's like IFRA compliant oak moss absolute that you can buy now um, that they've kind of, you know, adjusted to make it IFRA compliant. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then there's some mild animalics in the dry down. So a little bit of civet, some little musk, a little castorium. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a retro nouveau. I really love it. It's one of those scents that the people who love it, love it. Other people are a little vexed. Like, I don't know what to do with that. I'm not sure. You know? <laughs> but if you're also not, you know, into vintage perfumes or not into retro nouveau, you might be a little like, this is so not modern that I don't know what to do with it. All right. Well, I hope that answers our sensitized question. We've got time for one more question. And this question is from Ami Ami Isu. I think I'm saying it correctly. Uh, their question is, what is your most artistic, extraordinary perfume besides Ibiza? Ah, <laughs> my most um, extraordinary artistic perfume. Boy, that's like choosing a favorite child. Um, hmm. uh, Okay, I'll just say that I don't know if I totally agree with this, but um, potentially Annika, because I will say this was the one that took me the longest to finally put into a bottle. I got the idea, I read about Annika, I didn't know how to say it, um, in 1993. And I started thinking about it and I started designing it in my head in 1993 and I didn't actually produce it until 2000 and. 15 <laughs> wow. and and that was because like it's in all botanicals so i had to find all the materials and seriously all the materials that are in it were not in production when i first started conceiving of it so wow. that might be it and then i would have to say my next choice would be giverny and bloom um because that came out of a kinetic sculpture scent sculpture that wow. i made for the denver art museum um, using different accords that would be sensor driven. So at different times, different amounts of all the different accords would be in the room. And wow. so it was literally like a perfume that shifted its amounts and its proportionality and relationships all the time. Wow. So, so maybe Giverny and Bloom. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, um, unfortunately we have to wrap up just because time has uh, passed and uh, Instagram. The fastest, most wonderful hour. <laughs> it certainly has. I want to say thank you uh, to everyone that's tuned in. Um, excellent questions as usual. Um, I want to say a big thank you to you, Dawn, for t taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule. Um, you have also offered to do a few giveaways on Send Provoking Sunday this weekend. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's my hope that a few people that haven't had a chance perhaps to experience your fragrances will now understand why I'm so passionate about your perfumes. And um, anything else you want to say before we close? No, other than thank you for the opportunity to chat with you. I mean, I, I think that you have built an amazing following with your passion and, um, you know, being able to host people like me to get to talk about our brand. I mean, what, what better thing could we do? <laughs> right, um, so right. Thank you for creating this venue and this, this platform and, and yeah, being a part of the community. Cause it's, it's huge. Like we all bring our passion and our, and our love of the beauty that is fragrance and we all get to share it. So thank you for making that happen. Thank you. And I want to extend that to the fragrance community because none of this I've done alone. This is something I have done in collaboration with a bunch of very equally passionate people. And uh, every day I meet new people. Every day I talk to someone new, a new follower. And, um, you know, I'm just fortunate that I'm able to say, hey, Dawn, would you mind coming and chat with us? And you say, yes, Gwen, definitely. So um, it, it was very nice. Uh, talking to you and uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to get to see you next, but um, I am looking forward to meeting you again 
and smelling some more perfumes and just, uh, you know, continuing our friendship. That's right. Yeah. I'm excited to be able to collaborate with you in any way I can. All right, Dawn. Thank you. I'm going to cut you off Sounds now. good. Bye. All right. Bye-bye, Dawn. What an incredible spirit and personality. I wanted to ask Dawn, um, her fragrances are so suave and so well blended, but she seems so energetic. Um, I wanted to ask her if there's, uh, you know, how does she manage to keep that much suaveness in her fragrances, yet she's so bubbly and energetic. Every I've met Dawn now three times, and it's been that way. Anyway, next time I talk to her, I'll ask her. Thank you guys for joining. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's presentation of Dawn Spencer Hurwitz. Uh, she's on Instagram, DSH Perfumes, and uh, she has a website. It is massive. I've been on her site many times. And uh, check out her fragrances. If you really enjoy uh, well-made perfumes, you, in, you like indie perfumes, um, I don't think you're going to be disappointed in the creations that she made. We didn't touch on, uh, you know, if her uh, works, uh, you know, mixed media, all natural, but I know she does a lot of mixed media stuff. And um, what I really like about Dawn's fragrances is they, they just, they're, they're always so well blended. Nothing I've smelled of hers was like, ah, oh, this is just off-putting. It may not always be for me, but always well-blended. So I just want to um, say check out her work, and uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed. And if you find something you like, let the rest of the community know so that others can discover some extraordinary fragrances. I'm going to scroll down just to see if there are any last-minute questions. Um, and... Uh, Dawn, again, is sponsoring a giveaway uh, this weekend on Sunday, Scent Provoking Sunday. So I hope you guys come by Sunday and uh, join a conversation. And good luck to you guys. I'll talk to you all soon.